Good evening and very warm welcome to all of you in our webinar series on Reflections on Development Economics. Today's lecture will be based on one of the most debated issues of this time, farm bills and its economic consequences. I extend my welcome to Professor Ovirup Sharkar of Indian Statistical Institute, Kolkata, who is the speaker of the day, and Professor Shoman Shikda of IIM, Calcutta, who will chair the session. Today, we are very happy that Professor Amita Dotto, one of the past teachers of the Department of Economics Presidency College, is among us. She has attended her 100th birthday on 23rd January this year. All faculty members of our department wish her a strong and healthy future. As a token of our love and respect, we are dedicating today's webinar to Professor Amita Dotto. Both Ovirubda and Shomenda are students of Dr. Dotto. Now I am handing over the session to Professor Shomen Shikda. Shomenda. Thank you, Moshumi. This is indeed a rare honor and privilege to be present on an occasion where uh, one of our teachers is, uh, has attended her birth anniversary and she is very much with us. The noise uh, I'll request, yeah, yeah, everyone to. Uh, and she is with us in a very real sense, intellectually very agile and active, as we shall be saying today. Let me give a brief introduction to our AD, Professor Amita Dotto. Professor Dotto was born in Dhaka in 1921 to Indira Choudhury and the well-known professor of chemistry, Dr. J.K. Choudhury. Her parents strongly believe in giving their daughters a good education and making them self-reliant. She had a brilliant academic career throughout, came first or second in IA, BA, MA, despite involvement in freedom movement during her post-graduation years. Her first appointment was in Lady Brebon College, Calcutta, 1943 to 1945. Then it was Dhaka University, 1945 to 46. Indraprastha College, Delhi, 1946 to 49. Then Lady Brebon College again. This is for a much longer term, 1950 to 1963. In 1964, she left for LSE for higher studies. She completed her PhD in international trade theory under Professor Harry Jamsar and returned in 1969. After that, she joined Presidency College in 1969 and continued there till her retirement in 1983. So my batch was uh, 1971 to 74, and she taught us both uh, microeconomics in our second year and international trade theory in our third year. I still remember those lectures. And Ovirup was also her student, and she is fondly remembered by uh, her ex-students. Now I request Ovirup to deliver the talk. Uh, okay. Um, I am deeply honored to be... Ovirup, just, just one thing. You will be speaking for one hour? About one hour, yes. Okay, fine, fine. Okay. I, 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 will, I will give you a remind, reminder before 10 minutes. Say. Uh, Shomenda, hello. Uh, yes. Hi. Just, I mean, to interrupt, Kollam. Omita, dear, kichu bolar chila je? 
problem of uh, uh, farm uh, no. economics and what whatever you would like to say i don't think that there is much of economics that you learned in your classes in this uh, respect uh, in here you have to you have um, you are entitled to have an economics of your own that you have developed even after your classes now yeah, that is what you are um i would like to hear how you have matured through time and uh, well uh, i'd be very happy if you give me the privilege of hearing your talks and to see how much you have matured during these years uh, thank you very much for inviting me and uh, uh, i would li like to uh, I'd like uh, this opportunity to hear you, as I have already said. Um, now, I, I like to go with it. Now, well, uh, I'm sorry that. Uh, excuse me. I'm sorry that uh, I'm now 100, and 100 years of age is not as uh, very light thing, you know. I uh, not that I like living this hundred years. Uh, without, uh, uh, without my uh, all my senses, I should say, I can't see properly, I can't hear properly, I can't think properly, and <laughs> with all these debilities, I am facing you. But I love to see. Uh, I would love to see, hear you talk uh, with me. I uh, think. And I'd like to know, I have tried myself to go through all the difficulties of farm laws, but I think that farm laws, the thing has, um, it has passed over my capacity of uh, here, um, analyzing this subject. So I, I'm eager to hear you and I therefore stop. Thank you very much, AD ma'am. Thank you very much. Now, now over you. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm indeed deeply honored to be invited to give a talk uh, to celebrate the 100th birthday of uh, our uh, beloved AD ma'am. Um, it's an emotional moment for me. And I can also see my other teacher, Professor Bagchi, it makes me nervous, of course, to give a talk in front of you know, Professor Eddie and Professor Bagchi. Uh, but anyway, I will, I will, I will go ahead. Um, indeed, it takes me back uh, about 50 years down the memory lane, uh, 1972 to be precise, when uh, we first entered Presidency College as students. Um, it was a trouble time. Um, the uh, countenance of China's chairman was gradually fading and uh, from, from the city walls, uh, giving way to the fiery images of the so-called Asia Mukti Shudra. And uh, 
you know, political battles were quite frequent within the college. And the air was always heavy with uh, jargons, uh, you know, uh, ill understood ideologies and so on. But what is very surprising is that the economics department was completely insulated from all this. What we learned, and uh, of course we learned from uh, Professor Dotto and from Professor Bhakti and, and, and from others, Professor Deepak Banerjee, uh, that, you know, we have to understand, analyze and judge an issue on the basis of economic reasoning and economic reasoning alone. Uh, that is what I have uh, inherited, I would say, from from the from from uh, presidency college, and uh, what I'll talk about my own humble uh, way of understanding or trying to understand the issues. Uh, I will try to do it using basic economic tools, economic tools that Omitari had taught us. So Omitari, it's not different from what you taught us, I'll be using the standard, very elementary form theory. You had taught us discriminating monopoly. I'll be using a little bit of that also. When data is selling, has some monopoly power in the domestic market, but is a price taker when he is selling to the government. So that's, uh, you know, you taught us uh, discriminating monopoly, you introduced us to John Robinson's book on imperfect competition. That was a great book. So all this has culminated, you know, to form our ideas about uh, the farm laws. So we will, uh, so, so let me just start with my presentation. Uh, okay. Um, I will <clears throat> so I will be talking about uh, the three farm bills, let us, which is which has given rise to so much controversy these days. There are three bills: the Farming Produce Trade and Commerce Bill, also known as the APMC Bypass Bill, the Farmers Agreement on Price Assurance and Farm Services Bill and the Essential Commodities Amendment Bill. They have been recently uh, cleared by the parliament. And there has been, uh, you know, large opposition to these bills, leading to subsequent political turmoil. We, we all know that. And it has triggered, uh, inter, uh, you know, a lot of protests by farmers. Uh, we all know that. Quite understandably, the ruling party is projecting the bills as a means of emancipation for the Indian farmer. And the opposition is viewing them as a recipe for his doom. So it's, it's extreme that people are talking about, complete extreme. Um, so it's necessary to understand the economic nuances. And that is what exactly what I'm trying to do. Uh, I will try to understand the economic nuances of the bills, keeping aside emotions, ideology, and political stances. As I said, uh, we were taught in presidency college by Omitadi and, and others just to use economic tools to understand specific issues. So I will just do that. First, a little uh, bit introduction about the bills themselves. What are the bills about? The first bill, the Farming Produce Trade and Commerce Bill, it seeks to allow barrier-free trade of farmers' produce. That is, now a farmer can sell to anyone he wants to. He doesn't have to go through the so-called mandis. He is free to sell to anyone. And then the second bill, uh, the farmers' uh, you know, agreement on price assurance and so on, it basically provides, tries to provide a framework for farmers with anyone or any party uh, he wish to come to 
uh, you know, he uh, into a contract with. So it frees him to enter into contract firm. And the third one, the essential commodities bill, it's an amendment basically. So previ uh, previously, there were certain restrictions on the amount private players can freely hold. And now that restriction has been lifted. Now private players allow, uh, are, are allowed to freely hold stocks of food grains. So the three bills taken together, the basic uh, you know, purpose of the three bills is to pave the way for corpora, uh, corporatization of Indian agriculture. That is to facilitate the entry of big corporates into the agricultural sector. Now, the firm is the first one. You can see the farmer can sell directly to the corporate. The second, the farmer can enter into contract farming with the corporate. And the third, corporates are expected to build big warehouses where they can freely stock uh, food grains and, 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 and other agricultural items. So all these uh, you know, restrictions that were there have been removed. And now the corporate can enter the Indian agricultural scenario. This is the purpose of the bill. So I will uh, build up a model. I will uh, uh, talk, you know, I will just try to build up a very simple theoretical model in terms of which one can understand the effects of entry of corporates. Um, so as I said, I will try to develop a theoretical framework. Uh, to to uh, understand the effects of corporatization. And we will actually look at the effects of corporatization on different types of agents. Um, we will find that different agents will be affected differently. The producers, the small producers, the traders, rural consumers, urban consumers, the government, government procurement, and so on how all these different types of agents are affected by corporatization. That is something that we are going to see. So first we will develop a model without corporates, and then we will introduce corporates to understand the effects of the bills. Now, uh, I must admit at the very outset that uh, I will be able to talk about only uh, a uh, small part of the bill, or maybe well, well, only a part of the bills, only a part of the uh, you know um, possible effects of the bills. Uh, there are other aspects of the bills. Ovidu, just sorry, Ovidu, I, I yeah, think well, somebody Nilanjana Patro wants to ask something. Well, just yes, one please. request: please ask questions if it is clarificatory at this stage. Okay. After the lectures end, there will be time for discussion and further please. questions. So only clarification. Please, please, please go ahead. You just tell me when someone has a question because I cannot see anyone's face. I just can see my presentation. Huh? So please, uh, uh, please go ahead with your question. You can write in the chat box or okay. uh, yeah, right. ask me. Uh, but I can I can take the question if it's clarificated. Yeah. Yeah. What is the question? No, no I I don't have a question. I, I don't know how. It's... Oh, okay. 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 Then go ahead. Okay. 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 Should I go ahead? Okay. Then, then I'm just going ahead. So what I'll do is I will develop a very simple model. Nothing fancy. Uh, this model can be extended, of course, uh, uh, but today I won't do that. Uh, I will build up a very uh, simple, basic model uh, to, uh, you know, first without corporates and then with corporates to understand the effects of corporatization. So uh, the scenario, it's a very simple scenario. We consider a single agricultural commodity. Um, a major commodity like say wheat or rice and there are two markets uh, rural and urban now now we don't do not have any corporates we have big traders traders okay they buy in the rural market 
uh, in the rural market, small producers are selling their stocks. Uh, who are the buyers? Okay, there are local buyers. Local buyers consist of landless laborers. Uh, they are paid, um, uh, you know, uh, money wages. So with that money, they have to buy food from the local market. Marginal farmers who do not produce enough to, uh, you know, sustain their consumption. So they have to go to the market to buy. And non-farm workers, of course. So these are poor people. Uh, if the rural price increases, these poor people, these poor people are affected. I will, I will come to that later. But in addition to these people, big traders are acquiring stocks from the rural market. Now, they are not directly buying stocks, but they have their agents. Uh, they have, uh, you know, smaller traders uh, are buying in the rural market. The uh, structure is pyramidal. So smaller traders selling to, you know, even uh, uh, slightly bigger traders and so on. And finally, it goes to the big trader, to the mandi, let's say. So in the rural market, there are presumably many rural markets, but for simplicity, I have assumed that there is a single rural market. And from that rural market, um, small traders are presumably buying. And uh, but but in my model, small traders will not appear uh, specifically into the model. Uh, they don't, uh, you know, uh, uh, without any uh, a loss of general uh, generality, we can just uh, uh, sort of suppress the small traders. We'll simply assume that the large traders are buying from the rural market. Maybe it's through small agents, but that is uh, uh, beside the point. So uh, the large traders are buying in the rural market. And apart from the large traders, the, uh, you know, consumers, rural consumers are also buying. Now, large traders, apart from traders, they are also large farmers. That is, uh, uh, you know, apart from uh, acquiring stocks from the rural market, they have stocks of their own, which they have produced. So, uh, so I'm combining large farmers with large traders. And uh, each, uh, there are not many of them. They have oligopolistic power, um, both in uh, when they're buying and when they're selling. So, uh, so large, these large traders uh, sell a part of their stocks. Uh, their stocks will consist of their own produce and the stocks they have bought in the rural markets. So they sell part of their stocks in the urban market and the remaining they're selling to the government. The government is buying stocks at a pre-announced minimum support price, MSP. And uh, we will assume that government purchase centers are located uh, at somewhat, you know, uh, at some distance uh, from remote rural areas so that Rural producers cannot directly sell to the government. Uh, the, you know, uh, sorry, uh, part of the reason could be, or the main reason could be, uh, there is a lumpiness of, uh, of transportation cost. So if you're producing uh, too little, uh, it, does, it is not worth your while to uh, take that little amount and spend that, uh, lumpy uh, transportation cost uh, to the uh, to to go to the government collection center uh, to sell your product so uh, you know this small uh, sellers small producers in the rural market they are selling uh, in the rural market itself uh, the traders are uh, acquiring these stocks and part of these stocks are sold to the government um, in fact um, according to uh, a recent study of the uh, NSS, only uh, less than 10% of farmers have access to uh, government purchase centers. So we will assume that only the large traders are selling to the government. Okay. Now, as I said, large traders enjoy oligopolistic power as sellers in the urban market. Uh, and they also enjoy oligopsonistic power as buyers in the rural market. So they have some, some uh, you know, 
monopolistic power, both as sellers and as buyers. But when they sell to the government, they act as price takers. So, so the government has already announced the price, and uh, when they are selling, they change that price, of course. Um, and said small farmers do not have any access to government purchase. Uh, fixed transportation cost prohibits small sellers to travel to government collection centers to sell their stuff. So that is, that is uh, I've already talked about that. Now, let us first consider the rural market. There are n large traders buying in the rural market and selling in the urban market and to the government. So there are n large traders. Small traders to whom the large traders are buying, as I said, are kept in the background and do not appear explicitly into the model. So these are, I'm assuming that these small uh, traders are basically acting like commission agents. They just buy at a price and sell uh, to the large trader uh, at, a, at a fixed commission. So they are there, but I'm not considering uh, them explicitly. So from now on, I will, uh, by trader, I shall mean large trader. And they are the key, uh, uh, you, you know, they are the key uh, players in this model. Um, X bar is the total output uh, brought to the rural market by small farmers. So the small farmers collectively uh, have produced an output equal to X bar. And suppose XI is the purchase by the ith trader from the rural market. And X is the, uh, you know, uh, summation XI. This is the total purchase of traders from the rural market. Now, uh, also, uh, Y bar I is IA traders own production. So uh, the total production by traders is Y bar. And X bar plus Y bar is total production of the agricultural good available. Now, we focus on post-harvest behavior of agents when production has already been realized. So we are just looking at the marketing aspect. Production uh, has already been realized. This is, you know, just um, uh, focusing on one aspect of, this, of these bills because the other aspect is the uncertainty uh, associated with production. I, I have not... Uh, uh, I, I have not addressed that that part of the problem, but that's a very important part. Uh, so, since output has already been realized, we treat X bar plus Y bar as given. So, output is given. Uh, question is uh, where to sell this output. Now, uh, for the IF trader, of course, XI is a choice variable, and also how much to sell to the government. That is another choice variable. So, in the rural market, if there is an inverse demand function, this is the price actually, if of the consumption um, by the uh, rural consumers, this is the rural consumers uh, inverse demand function of small buyers in the rural market and Q is the price. So Q, the price, actual price obtained in the rural market is basically equal to the F of the amount available to the rural consumers. So X bar is what the farmers bring to the market. X is the total amount that is bought by the large traders. So the difference is what is <coughs> um, uh, available to the rural consumers. Now, uh, uh, of course, we make this assumption that if prime is negative, there's a demand curve. And uh, we also assume if double prime is positive. Now, this, uh, it's, it's greater than equal to zero. If it's equal to zero, then the demand function is linear, but we don't have to assume linearity. The only uh, reason for assuming this is to, you know, make uh, things simpler. Uh, it will, as we will see in a moment, this F double prime greater than equal to zero will give rise to an upward rising marginal cost. That's all. Um, so I just don't want to get into uh, technical details, so I am just making this assumption. This means that 
the uh, you know the uh, demand curve that we are talking about uh, for the rural sector the demand curve is concave uh, anyway so i will just make that assumption uh, the total cost of uh, buying from the rural market of the if trader is simply the price f of x bar minus x is the price times x i this is the amount he is buying the marginal cost of buying then is simply the derivative of that um and um okay and when i'm calculating this marginal cost this is assuming that the purchases of all other uh, traders are constant so that uh, in this derivative i'm assuming uh, del x del x i is equal to 1 so only the ih trader is buying and that defines his marginal cost and uh, the second derivative of the marginal cost as i said this is the second derivative and this is positive uh, this is a sufficient condition for that to be positive is that if double prime is greater than equal to 0 so i will make that assumption uh, and um, you know this uh, is a simplifying assumption as i said and the only uh, uh, reason for assuming this is to guarantee that the marginal cost of buying from the rural market is increasing in the quantity market and of course uh, if the uh, demand curve is linear uh, you know marginal cost will be upward rising so it's satisfied for linear demand the if trader in addition has carrying costs so buying is one part the, the marginal cost of buying is one part of the cost then there is a carrying cost alpha xi plus beta y bar i which are proportional to the output sold so um, you see alpha is uh, the carrying cost of xi it includes payment to small traders commission agents who are actually buying from the rural market and uh, bringing it to the large trader and of course it um, includes transportation cost and storage cost so it includes uh, payment to small traders as well as transportation and storage cost on the other hand beta carrying cost of yi this is own stock that includes only transportation and storage cost that does not include payment to small traders so i will assume that alpha is greater than beta uh, so i have traders total cost of selling is this is the uh, cost of buying from the rural market the first part the second part is uh, the carrying cost of what he has bought from the rural market and the third is carrying cost uh, of his own output to the urban market or to the government so uh, so consequently marginal cost of selling for the i trader is beta for sales up to y i so first he sells his own stocks marginal cost is just beta and then it goes up to mci plus alpha for sales greater than y i so there is a jump after he is uh, he has exhausted selling his own stocks i will assume that these are traders so they uh, in equilibrium they are selling more than what they Uh, have of their own so they are actually buying from the rural market and selling to the uh, urban market and to the government and of course uh, it's um, good to uh, um, remember uh, uh, or realize that uh, in addition to this marginal cost each trader has a fixed cost which includes the cost of cultivation so we have assumed that uh, you know um, that uh, production has already taken place but it has involved a fixed cost we, we uh, you know since the decision of production has already been taken since production has already been uh, realized we will treat the cost of cultivation as a fixed cost which needs to be covered uh, by operating profits otherwise uh, you know cultivation itself will become non profitable okay so um, let us now go into the urban market uh, <clears throat> again there is an inverse demand function in the urban market f 
and we will assume for the urban market we will assume that f prime is of course negative but if double prime is less than equal to zero it convexes uh, this basically again gives a downward sloping marginal revenue curve uh, so i will make that simplifying assumption and uh, zi is sales by ith trader and z is total sales in the urban market so uh, <clears throat> marginal revenue of the i s trader is simply this uh, the derivative of that given z um, and this is assumed to be positive in the rel uh, relevant range and um, the marginal this is very important you see uh, the marginal revenue schedule is the same for all i the the traders differ with respect to they are initial stocks that is the stock that they have produced themselves but the marginal revenue schedule is the same for everyone because each of them uh, are selling to the urban market okay and this marginal revenue uh, is uh, falling uh, guaranteed by the assumption that f double prime is less than equal to 0 uh, as i said the only role of f double prime less than equal to 0 is to guarantee that marginal revenue is falling okay so uh, apart from that there is government purchase uh, government announces a minimum support price r at which it has an infinite demand it is willing to buy any amount the i a trader sells uh, z i g to the government total sales to the government is some of that some do for all traders uh, so for the i a trader xi plus y bar i this is his total stocks xi is the amount that he has purchased from the rural market y bar i is what uh, he has uh, himself produced <coughs> and that <coughs> is equal to his total sales zi is sales to the urban market and zi g is sales to the government and in the aggregate this is all this also holds now the ia trader maximizes profits um this is the revenue from sales to the urban market r times zig is revenue by sales to the government minus cost of uh, buying from the rural market minus the carrying costs very simple and this is subject to the quantity constraints i will assume that they hold with equality so total um, sales is equal to total stocks that he has and i can reduce the number of choice the choice variables are zi zig and xi i can reduce the number of choice variables uh, to zi and xi just using this constraint uh, that's straightforward and then uh, this is my uh, you know uh, profit uh, maximization uh, this is my profit which uh, the trader wants to maximize and the first order condition very simple just marginal revenue equal to marginal cost equal to r this is the msp r is the uh, you know uh, uh, the uh, support price minimum support price uh, announced by the government so marginal revenue is equated to r marginal cost is equated to r now here this means that this is very important for 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 my analysis you see the government um, announces an msp so the trader he is selling to two markets to the government at a fixed price and to the uh, urban market at a downward sloping marginal revenue so he maximizes his uh, uh, you know revenue by equating r with marginal revenue in the urban market again he is buying from the rural market so his marginal cost must be equal to his marginal uh, it must be equal to what he can get at the margin which is equal to r so his what is important is that his decision to sell is becoming sort of independent of his decision uh, to buy he is buying you know uh, the anything that he uh, has in excess of selling to the uh, urban market he can sell to the government so these two decisions 
can be taken sort of independently. I will, I will uh, uh, come to that uh, in more detail later, the consequences of that. Um, so uh, a Kuno Nash equilibrium is simply a collection Z star I, Z star IG, and X star I, um, such that the first order conditions hold simultaneously. I will try to, um, OK. So before I uh, uh, represent the equilibrium in a diagram, uh, I define marginal revenue. Uh, see, this phi function is nothing but the marginal revenue when total sales, uh, sorry, this is total purchase. Total purchase is, is at equilibrium. So given X star, if Xi, the ith trader, is uh, increasing or decreasing his uh, purchase, then uh, uh, the marginal cost that he has to incur at evaluated at the equilibrium value of total sales. That is the phi function. And similarly, the mu function is the marginal revenue evaluated at uh, Z star, where Z star is the equilibrium, um, uh, you know, total sales to the uh, urban market. So uh, X star I and Z star I are simply solutions to phi equal to R and mu equal to R. Because we know that in equilibrium, um, you know, marginal revenue must be equal to R and marginal cost must also be equal to R. So we can just uh, use a simple diagram to uh, represent this. For the ith trader, first consider marginal cost. Uh, up to y bar i, his marginal cost is beta. And then above that, it jumps to uh, you know marginal cost of uh, buying uh, plus alpha. And then it increases. Uh, all the way up to here, okay, uh, okay. This is MSP uh, equal to R. So his total, uh, you know, uh, stock that is Z star I plus Z star I G. This is what he sells to the urban market and to the government. That is determined by this intersection. On the other hand, he has a marginal revenue, uh, downward sloping marginal revenue. Uh, where uh, the, uh, uh, you know, this is a function of the total uh, amount sold Z star and ZI. So the intersection point must be Z star I itself. So this is, uh, you know, a very simple uh, representation of his equilibrium. And how we determine Z star I and Z star, I have uh, one more diagram. Uh, just uh, look at the blue line and the upward rising line. Just ignore the yellow line for the time being. So, um, you know, first of all, there is an upward rising relationship between Z star I and Z star because Z star is some simply N times Z star I. So this is an upward rising relationship. And the downward sloping relationship, it's, it's, it's very easy to see. Uh, if, you, if you go back to this diagram, if Z star increases, then this marginal revenue shifts down. So that Z, ZI in equilibrium, Z star I in equilibrium also comes down. So if Z star increases, Z star I goes down. And that is uh, shown by this downward sloping line. So the intersection point determines Z star and Z star I simultaneously. Similarly, exactly in a similar way, we can determine uh, you know, uh, X star. Just ignore this uh, blue line here. Just look at this. Uh, downward sloping line. Again, this downward sloping line is obtained from uh, this diagram. If, uh, you know, X star increases, this uh, marginal cost shifts to the left, one can show, and Xi falls. Okay. So that gives uh, the downward sloping line. And so uh, the intersection of them determines uh, X star I and X star. So, um, this is how we determine equilibrium. Uh, Shoman, how much time do I have? Shoman, how much time no, do I have? Uh, you have 30 minutes. Oh, 30 okay. minutes. Okay, so, so I won't take all that uh, much time. Anyway, I will. I will uh, so I have enough time. Uh, okay, so some implications of this model, which we will use later. Um, 
first of all suppose there are two traders uh one is bigger than the other so y bar i is greater than y bar k the ia trader is bigger in the sense that he has more stocks of his own then our equilibrium implies that they are selling the same amount in the arbor market but the bigger trader is selling more to the government so the government is basically buying whatever is extra whatever whatever is left over from arbor arbor sales so as you can see in this diagram this marginal revenue is the same for everyone and given r that is also same uh, for everyone uh, you know all the traders are selling um uh, selling uh, the same amount to the arbor market but if a trader has more initial stocks suppose this uh, you know uh, instead of y bar i we have y bar j or something then uh, this will uh, shift this marginal cost line will shift to the right and then he will be selling more to the government so the extra amount he just sells to the government uh, that is that is uh, clear uh, <coughs> our imp that is one implication so one one implication is that you see larger traders are more dependent on the government so uh, this is just uh, i'm making a loose statement perhaps but you see the movement that we are observing is basically um, uh, led by relatively larger traders and what i'm trying to argue is that it is the larger traders whose uh, uh, you know uh, uh, whose interests are affected more by the entry of the corporates than the relatively smaller ones but we will come to that later in more detail the second implication suppose there is a land reform or land fragmentation due to some other reason say inheritance uh so that i'm trying to capture that by a redistribution of output uh to smaller farmers from larger farmers so uh dx bar is positive and dy bar is negative okay so there is a redistribution from uh, uh from large to small this will reduce sales to the government keeps urban sales and prices unaffected and increases rural consumption by reducing rural price how do we get that well you see a fall in y bar keeps urban sales unchanged because assuming that all traders are still uh, selling to the government um if there is a fall in their own stocks okay um uh, that does not affect what they are selling to the urban market because that marginal revenue marginal cost remains unchanged so um so the sales on uh, from y bar that falls on the other hand x bar since x bar increases it shifts the downward sloping line upwards that is here in this diagram uh if x bar uh, increases this uh, downward sloping line increases uh, you know shifts up you can uh, one can show that so that more amount is bought from the rural market x star i increases x star increases so there is you know uh, sorry uh, so on the one hand y bar is falling but x bar is increasing so what is the net effect you can one can show uh, it's straightforward to show just using a little bit of algebra that dx star is less than dx bar that is the amount that is purchased is less than you know the additional amount that is purchased is less than the additional amount that has been redistributed to smaller farmers the reason is that the intuitive reason is that it is because uh, the price uh, in the rural market has gone down the traders are buying more but in order that the rural price goes down uh, this must happen you see more should be available to rural consumers given the downward sloping demand so uh, you know uh, dx star is less than dx bar which means that 
uh, redistribution of output from large to small will benefit rural consumers, keeping urban consumers unaffected. Only sales to government will fall. Okay, then uh, the third implication, a rise in MSP. Suppose MSP rises. That will reduce urban sales and will increase urban price. It will increase sales to government. It will increase rural purchase by traders and rural and it will also increase rural price it will reduce rural consumption so how, why because if r increases um, here the curve will shift down uh, z star i and uh, sorry this is uh, yeah for a higher r both z star i and z star z star will fall which is intuitive because now you are getting a better price from the government so you will sell less to the urban market and more to the government, which is quite intuitive. Uh, on the other hand, because you are getting a better price from the government, the trader will buy more from the rural market. So uh, for a higher R, this curve will shift up and therefore uh, X star I and X star will rise. Uh, this in turn will raise rural prices affecting rural consumers okay so uh, this is our third implication implication four if there is a bumper crop um, leading to a rise in y bar x bar both let's say um, increases sales to the government uh, keeping urban price and sales unchanged you see the marginal revenue curve does not change r remains remaining unchanged marginal revenue remaining unchanged Urban price and sales remain unchanged, but the rural price goes down because now the supply has increased um, and rural consumption will increase. Anyway, this is, uh, uh, I think this is uh, intuitive. I don't have to explain uh, uh, why. <clears throat> See, the implication of this is that if there is a fluctuation in output, then urban markets are completely insulated from that fluctuation. So instead of a bumper crop, if there's a crop failure, for example, even then the urban price and sales remain unchanged, but rural price goes up and rural consumption goes down. Exactly the opposite happens. So fluctuations in output completely translate into fluctuations in rural consumption and rural price. But because of the MSP, the urban consumers are completely insulated or insured against any, uh, you know, fluctuation in output. This is the implication of, uh, you know, this is our fourth implication. And there is one more implication. Um, a rise in N, suppose the number of, uh, you know, uh, traders increase. That basically increases. If, if uh, the number of traders increase, then what happens is that, um, you know, if, okay, let's see. Uh, uh, if the number increases, then in these diagrams, the upward rising curves uh, shift to the left. And therefore, um, Z star I falls. Each trader is selling less. But the total amount that is sold to the market, urban market, increases. Similarly, each trader is buying less than before, but the total amount bought is uh, increasing. So this is not surprising at all because as N increases, it increases competitiveness of the market. Um, so if the market gets more competitive, then, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> market transaction increases, uh, more is sold to the urban market um, and more is bought from the rural market. And, and as a result, um, you know, um, the uh, urban, um, uh, urban price will go down and rural price will go up. Anyway, it's, it's uh, not important. This is, this is clear. Uh, <clears throat> Yes, one more thing. The effect, this, 
whatever is ambiguous. Why? Because uh, because of increase in uh, competition, because n increases, uh, z star increases independent of the increase in x star. You see, as I said, the maximization exercise by the trader, it has two separate parts. How much to buy, which is dictated by MSP, because on the margin, the uh, you know trader is selling at MSP. And also, the other part of the decision is how much to sell to the urban market, which is again dictated by R, the MSP. But these are independent decisions. So that when N increases, the increase in Z star, that is total amount that is sold, is independent of the increase in X star, the total amount that is bought. So we don't know uh, what happens to the difference. And therefore, we don't know uh, whether government purchase or you know sales to the government goes up or goes down. That is ambiguous. So, um, OK. Now, let us consider corporates, entry of corporates. Um, we will take it as given that new farm bills make way for corporate entry into the uh, into agricultural trade. So, uh, corporate, suppose corporates enter, and suppose there are M corporates enter the market, and corporates may have lower costs of storage and transportation. They may be more efficient. They have better warehousing facilities, better technology, and so on. That is possible. Uh, but one thing we will assume, corporates do not have the opportunity of selling to the government at MSP. So MSP is minimum support price to the farmers, to the traders, perhaps, but not to corporates. We will assume that corporates are not selling to the government. This is a crucial assumption that will differentiate uh, the corporates from the traders. So the new equilibrium is just, you know, uh, we redefine Z as ZI uh, is the, uh, you know, uh, sales by IF trader and ZJ by the J corporate. So this is the total amount of sales. Similarly, purchase um, XI by the trader and XJ by the uh, corporate. And the equilibrium is, again, just like before. Uh, for the uh, trader, uh, marginal revenue is equated to R. Marginal cost is also equated to R. And uh, the total amount XI plus X bar I is equal to the amount that is sold in the urban market and to the government. For the corporate, Marginal revenue is simply equal to marginal cost. There is no MSP. So whatever is bought, XJ, is sold in the urban market. Right now, we have not introduced any international trade, possibility of trade. So uh, whatever is bought uh, in the rural market is sold in the urban market. So uh, equilibrium looks something like this. The marginal cost of the uh, typical corporate, I have drawn it to be less, uh, to be lower, but it does not have to be, because if uh, you know for this uh, Y I, uh, the marginal cost of the corporate lies lower. Corporates have a lower carrying cost gamma. Okay, I should have mentioned that gamma is less than alpha. Okay, so but uh, the thing is that. If yi is sufficiently uh, large, then this stretch can be extended here, and the uh, marginal cost of the trader can lie below uh, that of the corporate. So that is not important. It can either lie uh, uh, above or, or lie below. But the important thing is that while the trader is equating MSP, that is R, with marginal revenue, the uh, you know, the corporate is equating marginal revenue with marginal cost. So typically, the corporate is selling more to the urban market than the trader. Or viewed differently, uh, when corporates enter, there is more competition. And there are two effects, really. Because of this competition, the traders are selling less. But also, 
because the corporates do not have the option of selling to the government they are selling more to the urban sector and that reduces sales by the traders by more that is their marginal revenue is shifting in when the corporates are selling more to the urban market so on both counts the uh, sales uh, the sales of the traders uh, are going down similarly when corp because corporates are buying from the rural market there uh, uh, you know that that creates competition and therefore the purchase of the trader uh, is also going down so the total uh, you know level of activity um, operations of the trader that is going down and that certainly reduces his profits so what are the consequences uh, entry of corporates increases the number of traders in the market just like uh, and uh, similar uh, the the effect is somewhat similar to an increase in n discussed above and this will increase rural price total purchase from the rural market by traders traders meaning traditional traders and corporates taken together total sales in the urban market at a lower price because total sales will increase therefore price will fall and lower profit for each traders so uh, as i as we saw corporates will sell more to the urban market than traders because they are equating their marginal revenue with marginal cost not with r uh, and the uh, okay so the net effect i'm just uh, 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 jotted them down corporate entry into the agri agricultural sector hurts rural consumers because more will be bought from the rural market price will increase and this may increase poverty because in the rural market it's the very poor who are buying from the rural market the you know the landless the marginal farmers and so on uh, they will have to face a higher price but on the other hand small producers will benefit because they can get a higher price uh, urban consumers will also benefit because uh, you know they can uh, get uh, a lower price more is being sold however uh, you know uh, urban markets are no longer insulated from fluctuations in output so urban consumers are gaining all right but they have to face more fluctuations because now if there is a uh, you know fluctuation in output if output falls for example that will be reflected in marginal cost and sales corporates are equating marginal cost with marginal revenue their sales will fall if there is a fall in output so the urban consumers will have will have to absorb some of the shocks that they were insured from insulated from uh, in the uh, earlier scenario um large traders will be hurt clearly small traders and commission agents who depend on, on them thousands of them they will also be hurt now um uh, and effect on government procurement is ambiguous as i said because of that independence of uh, the urban market and uh, how much you buy uh, the point is that uh, okay let me just uh, so you see the traders why are they agitating uh, what is their apprehension you see after corporates enter operating profit of each trader will go down that's that's clear but for each of this trader you know uh, fixed cost is very high because it includes the way we have uh, uh, written our model the fixed cost includes the cost of cultivation which is big and it is likely that profits net of fixed costs become very low or even negative so operating costs are going down fixed cost including cost of cultivation remaining the same uh the you know uh, net profits profits net of fixed costs could become negative so this is a question of existence for the traders uh and will you will you you have 10 minutes oh okay okay i will i will finish i will finish um again the, their dependence dependence of traders on government msp increases because now they are selling less in the urban market 
the larger is the trader more is the dependence because you know they are in uh, uh, in any way more dependent on the government and this is why they want a legislation guaranteeing msp this is my my humble way of interpreting it uh, so uh, so why are they uh, why do they want uh, a legislation because they will become more dependent on the government uh, on the government msp and you see the average price received by traders is less than the average price received by corporates why because see the average price received by traders is the urban price and r but r is equal to the marginal revenue and marginal revenue is less than the price so the urban price the corporates are just receiving the urban price okay the traders are partly receiving that urban price and partly marginal revenue which is equal to r so if you take the weighted average it has to be less than the price received by the corporate uh, <clears throat> anyway this is this diagram we have already uh, discussed i will i will round up you see there is another question why is the government reluctant to commit uh, to msp now this is not a part of my model but uh, i didn't have much time actually i could have extended it to uh, bring in international trade suppose this is just uh, you know uh, heuristics suppose corporates main aim is to sell to the international market not so much to the uh, domestic market but uh, more to the international market now at present as things stand at present msp is quite uh, you know quite a bit bigger than the international price uh, in, in in some cases it's 1.5 times in some cases is uh, it's 1.2 times and so on i just checked the uh, price of wheat uh, in the us market and compared it with uh, the msp current msp uh, using the standard you know uh, uh, exchange rate so uh, msp seems to be uh, quite uh, you know quite a lot bigger so corporates will be at a disadvantage they are buying at the same price as the traders right they are buying from the rural market but selling at a lower international price compared with the traders the, uh, the traders can always sell if the msp is high uh, then sellers uh, then the traders can always sell at the msp which is higher then the international price which is lower so it is possible that to guarantee their entry in any case the government wants to uh, woo the you know uh, corporates they want entry of corporates to guarantee that government may have to lower msp in future otherwise corporates may not enter so that is the fear of the uh, you know of the farmers that msp to uh, to facilitate corporate entry government may have to lower msp which will hurt their own profits severely so uh, i will uh, uh, just make some uh, concluding remarks we just considered a very uh, simple theoretical framework um, uh, to understand the apprehensions of farmers regarding the farm bills and the apprehensions as we said uh, as i have already said is one is reduction of operating profits Uh, which might render production prof unprofitable uh, the other apprehension is dependence on msp which itself may not remain at its current level to accommodate corporates the problem is not only of large traders but thousands of small traders commission agents dependent on their networks so it's a question of affecting the future of a large number of people now these small agents this is something that i have not modeled but one can model this easily these small agent agents apprehend to lose not only their livelihood but also you see they get a kind of protection or insurance from the large traders the large traders are of course exploiting them no doubt but if the need arises the large trader typically will also help them maybe to uh, exploit them more in future but in time of need if 
a small trader needs money for an illness in the family or for some other reason, he will typically go to the large trader to whom he sells. So that insurance will not be there anymore if the whole network collapses. Similarly, um, you see, if small farmers, producers, enter into contracts with corporates, this is something that, that, that I have not uh, modeled, but these are the aspects that I have, uh, you know, I could have modeled, but didn't. So the other thing is that if small producers enter into contracts with corporates, they can hardly enforce these contracts, you see, if corporates re remain. So let me give you an example. Suppose the corporate uh, enters into an agreement to buy, let's say, 100 um, quintals of uh, rice at, uh, uh, you know, at an agreed price. But suppose there is a bumper crop and the price of ri uh, rice goes down in the market, in the spot market, then the corporate can simply renege on its contract and buy from the market. It will save a lot of money that way. Now, this, uh, you know, uh, this uh, breach of contract, of course, one can go to the court, but small producers do not know uh, how to, you know, how to proceed. Uh, so, uh, and, and in any case, it will take uh, years to, you know, enforce this contract, which the small producer can ill afford. <coughs> so, <coughs> I will conclude by saying that legal assistance to small agents, insurance markets, credit markets, often large traders give the small, uh, 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 small uh, traders credit. And uh, this credit, they, they, they cannot get credit from the formal sources often. So unless there are infrastructure, necessary infrastructures like insurance markets, legal infrastructure, credit markets, and so on, um, these bills should not be put into practice. So one uh, uh, should have necessary infrastructure before these bills are put into practice. And one should also worry about uh, the profitability of production, uh, if it uh, if if this profitability goes down, then uh, you know production uh, itself might get jeopardized. So thank you very much. I will stop here, and 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 I will be very uh, happy to answer this. Okay, Oviruk, thank you very much. Yeah, you have you have used the simple tools of microeconomics to throw uh, light on illuminating light on different aspects of a very thorny issue. So it's a true economist uh, approaching a problem, a very thorny problem. Well, uh, uh, let me uh, first ask Professor uh, Omiyo Banchi. Uh, first of all, sir, would you like to say something about Professor Omita Dotto? Sir, please unmute yourself. I had the privilege of having Professor Amitra Dutta as my colleague in Presidency College from 1969 and 19, to 1974. And I have very fond memories of her from those days. And also, I used to see Mojumuti at that time quite a lot. She, I think, joined B College soon after. I don't know what she did later on. And I'm very happy to see that Professor Dutta is fully alert. He says, uh, if one can read an old age like us with a fully alert mind, there is nothing better than that. And I hope that she will continue to have same alertness of mind for a number of years more. And on OPU, uh, I have to re read your paper fully because I could not see the diagrams of the equations properly. Uh, and I hope that at some time it will you will write it up. There are certain yes. Uh, there's there are one or two intuitive conclusions which I could not follow, uh, but I'm sure if I can read the paper, I will get that. Such as why your pre-corporate entry model fluctuations in output 
will not affect the carbon consumers. That is not something that we, I could understand. I can uh, I'll, uh, either you explain it more fully or I will read it later. But one thing I did not understand is why, apart from the case of contract farming, you left the farmers out. You talked only about the traders. You see, the farmers, the big farmers, sell directly to markets in the urban market. They do not sell to traders. It is the big yes, farmers yes. job in Marian, in Western Uttar Pradesh, where the BKU is very active, or in Karnataka, the Karnataka Rayata Union, or in Maharashtra, the uh, big cotton producers. They sell directly to the uh, in, to Mandis and to the government, and it is they who have provided the energy to the farmers' movement, not the traders. And that is something that you have uh, really uh, not discussed fully. Uh, what I have is the trader and the traders who are big traders as well as big producers. So they are selling directly. I can uh, always have a situation where. They are not buying from the rural market, just selling their own stuff. So these are the big producers. And uh, I am just concerned about the big producers alone. I mean, they are the people who are getting affected. So in my model, I'm all the time I'm talking about these big producers uh, who are selling directly to the government or to the urban market. This is... this is. Uh, so that is verified. I mean, okay. for a person in Eastern India, uh, one is unable to understand the education because here most of the uh, farmers are small. They do not have direct access to the urban market, generally sell to traders, and few of them have really access to the government either. Right. Uh, either. <laughs> For a state like West Bengal, land is so scattered that it's very costly to acquire stocks for the corporates. The corporates will first go to Haryana or Punjab to acquire stocks. It's uh, much easier. So uh, the Haryana farmers are the ones who are really, you know, uh, uh, worried about uh, this corporate thing. So that is, that is, that is. And the modification of the essential commodities act will have a very severe effect on Indian consumers because you know the Indian paniyas, whenever they have the opportunity to stock and uh, have uh, extortionate prices, they will always do that. We have had a lot of experience in the past. So it is not just the farmers who will be affected, but ordinary consumers will also be affected. Thank you, thank you, thank you Professor Banshi. Now, Ovirup, I have a couple of small questions. One is, this is just a general thing. Uh, what does the government do with the amount procured? Us usually what it does, and can it be accommodated into the model somehow? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. What is usually done? We can have we can, uh, easily add the distribution system to distribute the output that the government acquires, or the government can hold it as a stock. So my plan is to extend it to a dynamic framework where you know you could have good harvest or bad harvest and the government can uh, you know uh, release or uh, buy stocks depending upon the harvest and so on but a uh, pds uh, uh, can easily be introduced. okay uh, okay N number two of you this is this is actually one period standard microeconomics right. very beautifully modified but actually you see the apprehension about corporates entries that once you get then give them entry, then this they get a foothold, and then their post entry behavior might change. And thereafter, with their cloud political well, political uh, thing can be purchased with their wealth and influence. Actually, once you give them entry, then you don't know what they will stop. For example, right now the export price is lower than the minimum support price, right? But once they get entry, after a while, they might be able to persuade the government to give them an export subsidy, right? So it should be the farmers, I am sure, are worried about this long-term consequences. 
that is it's a longer horizon problem and this has happened time and again now all over the world that corporates are for boss uh, brought in they produce certain positive results improve efficiency and so on and so forth good things definitely but over time after they have gained entry you are into a different node of the game tree so there in that different node the game changes enter and then the farmers or consumers they simply become powerless the game is entirely on to a different node and this is a real cause for concern from my point of view this has happened time and again into uh, in 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 the world right so no uh, uh, what you have done is excellent We're using standard tools of microeconomics but if you want to capture the farmer's nervousness or apprehension it has to be a longer horizon more strategic thing right okay yeah thank you i enjoyed your lecture a lot yeah. okay so okay. okay anybody else you can write in the chat box or you can raise your hand shominda there are yes. so many uh, questions uh, in the chat box would you please oh, okay 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 i'll just So, will, can I ask a question? Yeah, please. please okay, okay. Paranta, let me let me go in sequence, right? There is a question by Aniruddha Shen. Yes. What about the effect of PDS? Uh, PDS, I have not modeled really. Uh, as I said, I really didn't get a lot of time to write this model. About not even a month, uh, maybe a month. So, uh, I. Plan to extend this model uh, to bring in uh, PDS, like Shobhan was saying. Yes. What does the government do with the stocks? To explain that, I need to bring in PDS. Yes, I have to bring in PDS. Then, uh, uh, Harshadeep Bishas, around 40% of Indian workforce is employed in agriculture, but the contribution of agriculture is nearly 12%, which means a large section. Of Indian population lives on meager national income. Remember this also in the context of discussion on subsidy. When we are talking of subsidizing agriculture, we are talking about subsidizing. For, uh, okay, so um, uh, okay, you see, yeah, uh, uh, agriculture's productivity is not very high, and um, uh, I haven't brought in production at all. So uh, my model is inadequate to address the question of low productivity. For that, I have to write a slightly extended model. I, I, I agree with that. Uh, Malobika asks, what about holding by farmers uh, or, or holding by traders? Well, for that, I need a dynamic model, uh, which I will. Uh, uh, I, I, I have uh, a plan of extending it to a dynamic model. Uh, where uh, the corporates will have a lower uh, storage cost, presumably, but a higher fixed cost, perhaps. Um, so that can be brought in. But I haven't done that. I I I, I must agree. So uh, that is all. Porontop, uh, Porontop's question. Can I Porontop, take? What's your question, Porontop? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Ovino, first, uh, yeah, yeah. I just came to know about your talk today, so I really enjoyed. And okay. uh, so it's a neat model, of course. And perhaps I have missed it, but I am just wondering. I that what is the reason? I, it it looks like this is the problem of the large farmers, right? Mostly the way you have portrayed. Okay, now if that is the case, why don't they collude and they form their own prices? Because I, you can say that it is too costly, and they are specially separated, all kinds of things. But why is it so costly? Because it is not costly for them to mobilize and paralyze the economy. If they can do that. They can constructively collude and just form a price and just compete with these corporations. You see, suppose instead of n sellers, there is a single seller. So they have colluded and formed a monopoly, right? Now, given that monopoly, if corporates enter, still the monopoly has to face competition. They cannot collude with the corporate, right? So. Why what can't they? they? Because they can always lower the cost. They can collude and they can significantly lower their the cost market. of storage, and they can just do the risk sharing, proper risk sharing arrangement. Okay, then I will go a little bit outside economics. You see, 
when we were talking about uh, corporates entering the retail sector for example uh, there there were many instances when local uh, you know entrepreneurs were colluding with uh, foreign firms you know they were uh, uh, selling them together but for agriculture i think there is a cultural difference you see oh, this cult is the nature is a black box if you bring culture no, nothing but, then there is no model no, really no 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 but you have to understand that uh, just entering into an agreement with a foreign or or even a domestic corporate for a farmer is not easy it's not easy it's uh, uh, of course one has to talk talk about culture because uh, you know the farmer does not know the nitty gritties of law of agreement of you know how the legal system works it's it's not uh, that simple see on the other hand the farmers do know what traditionally they have inherited what traditionally you know uh, uh, the small farmers are selling to them uh, how much to pay what are the uh, uh, you know uh, uh, accepted uh, uh, means of transaction those are more or less traditional it's a, uh, uh, it's more feudal so to say but uh, there you know the uh, modern legalities are i think outside they they are not very comfortable with that uh, okay okay Yeah. So, man. Uh, yeah. 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 And any any other questions? Uh, there is a question from Shahana Rai Choudhury. Shahana, no, sure. please can ask or. Okay. Yes. Yes. Shahana. Yes. Unmute yourself. Yeah, sir. Uh, a very simplistic presentation uh, to capture a complex phenomenon, as always, has been your lectures at ISI. So very nice presentation. So like I liked it. So my question is uh, that the, uh, it relates to your theoretical model uh, uh, that you know the small traders uh, they have very high transportation cost and that is why they cannot really sell their produces to the government directly. So what if the MSPs are increased manifolds, uh, manifold and uh, if they can access uh, you know uh, uh, because it is increased manifold. They can sell to the government, and then will the corporate central will make any changes, consequential changes? Uh, if uh, MSP, theoretically speaking, if MSP is increased uh, uh, many times, I mean, of course, there is a uh, budget constraint of government. I mean, government uh, already is uh, constrained with funds, uh, so uh, that is one problem. But if MSP is increased. The other problem is that the corporates won't enter. You see, high MSP is an uh, is a deterrent to corporate entry, and that is why farmers apprehend that in future, uh, you know, MSP could be reduced just to accommodate corporates. So that is another problem. So um, you know, uh, MSPs there are problems of increasing MSP. I think. Thank right. you, sir. Anybody else? Yes, I have a question. Um, Indra, Indrani, okay. Yes. Um, actually, what I uh, observed that they actually through procurement, the large farmers are getting benefits, but the consumers are not getting any sort of benefit through PDS because issue price to finance the increasing burden of subsidy, the issue price is almost equal to the market price. Actually, uh, the large farmers are getting assured income in the form of this uh, MSP. And if the corporate is coming, there is doubt whether they will do any beneficial impact on the consumers or not. Will they have any benefit? Will that happen? Now, you are saying that because of the PDS, the urban market is insulated from the ups and downs in the prices. Whether if the corporates comes in, is there any beneficial effect on the consumers? Model. Uh, there are two things. One is that when corporates enter, there is more competition in the urban market, and therefore more is sold. Price comes down. This is one aspect. The other aspect is that previously, that is before corporates were coming, uh, had uh, you know entered. 
uh, the arbor market was completely insulated because of the MSP. Uh, well, whatever excess is produced or whatever deficit is there is absorbed by the government. But after corporate center, the urban market is no longer insulated from output fluctuation. So on that count, urban uh, consumers will lose. So on one count, prices will be lower, but on other, uh, you, you know, other aspect of it is that there will be more fluctuations. So I think there are uh, these two things. Uh, have to be considered uh, together. Virudha, uh, I have a question. Yes, yes. Uh, this is Aru. Uh -huh. uh, um, actually, uh, the motto of these three new agricultural bills is to uh, intensify the corporate control over Indian agriculture. Right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, do you not think that uh, the corporate control over Indian agriculture has been started long before um, uh, when the green revolution has been started and our uh, indigenous seed supply system has been transformed from farmer seed supply system to corporate seed supply system, starting from HOIV to hybrid seed to genetically modified seed. And in this way, the total agricultural base has been taken away by the corporate um, um, uh, uh, entities and the transnational corporations. So uh, actually, um, uh, whether these new bills will add something new to this corporate control, or it has already been in existence? Uh, you see, of course, we had large farmers, and they were using uh, better seeds and uh, more irrigation and so on. That's a different story, but it was not so much corporatization in the sense that the way these firms operated, it's you can't call them corporates. Corporates, you can come across corporate farming in the United States or in or in Europe, where you farm with a big, uh, you, you know, plot of land. You um, your shares are listed in the uh, stock market and so on, that's a different story altogether, right? And especially, see, these farmers, these large farmers getting support from the government in terms of MSP. So that's not corporate. I, I, I don't think that is corporate. And another thing is that when at the beginning of the 1990s, people were talking about uh, liberalization, agriculture was left out because People thought that uh, agriculture, there are not many corporates, but agriculture is at least uh, run by private agents. So there is no need for immediate need for privatization. But later on, uh, people like also Gulati and, 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 and others, they started talking about, uh, you, you know, liberalizing Indian agriculture by allowing the farmers to export. Right to lift, uh, you know, uh, you know, barriers uh, to trade. That is one step. But actually, bringing in large corporates, you see, the corporates are not going to. I don't think they are going to go into production that much. They are going into trade. That is why I uh, put my emphasis on trade. These are, you know, uh, these big corporates are after retailing. They are going to acquire funds, uh, you know, stocks from the rural sector and sell them at the, uh, you know, big urban uh, uh, centers. So that Oviru. is what they are doing. Yes. Oviru, uh, I, I, uh, what, what I think is, no, no, the corporates will be very much interested in contract farming. I am sure. No. Yes, sir, not only trading, they will be very much interested in contract. They are, all, they are already doing it. PepsiCo is already doing it. Yes, yes. Yeah. They are interested in the crop, not in the production process at such. Contract farming, yes, of course. But they will be buying that. Then they will either uh, produce potato chips or, you know, whatever, basmati rice, whatever. Then they will sell to the market. But directly, whether they will set up a plan to produce rice or wheat or potato, that I don't know. No, no, no. Uh, no, no, I'm not. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, in under contract farming, they keep a very close watch how the thing is being produced. 
depends on the production process, on the quality and everything. It's a very close supervision, right? Very close. So they will they will do that, and they are already into that. Actually, Ovirudha, in total agricultural sector, uh, if you analyze, there are three layers. One is the grain trading, and second is the uh, agricultural input market, and third is the agricultural produce market. If you see in world uh, agricultural system, all these three layers are being uh, monopolized. Only three or four farms are controlling the entire grain trading, entire uh, input sector. And uh, and the uh, agricultural produce market, and that is and that setup is coming in India also. So, but that monopoly was there even before. We did some surveys on potato markets, for example, in West yeah. Bengal. West Bengal is a big producer of potato. Now, the whole potato trade. Uh, I'm just talking about the early uh, 2000. The whole pro potato trade in West Bengal was controlled by two three people. So that monopoly was there. Uh, only thing is that now the corporates are coming in with their you know advanced technology uh, and you know different uh, you, you know organization and so on. So uh, and the way I have made a distinction is that they are not going to get any uh, minimum support price. Therefore, they are going to reduce the minimum support price to the extent possible. Oniru, Oniru, Oniru Dushan has another question. Uh -huh. Sure, sure. But no more questions on Irudh. Uh, will inclusion of government monitoring in contracts uh, between corporates and farmers provide any safeguard? Yes, ideally, uh, government monitoring should be there. Absolutely. I mean, uh, that's what I'm arguing. Uh, you, you see, there has to be a proper infrastructure, uh, uh, legal infrastructure, proper monitoring, proper you know other markets should also be there. Before you bring in corporates, so uh, there is a very well-known result in theoretical economics that, given that some uh, some markets do not exist, if you open one or two markets, liberalize one or two markets, that might lead to uh, you know inefficiency. That might lead to a Pareto uh, you know uh, inferior uh, solution. So that kind of thing can happen here. Okay, I think I should. Uh, well, this discussion is uh, has been very lively, and given the topic, this is to be expected, an extremely lively uh, discussion. But I I think I should uh, bring it to an end. So finally, I thank Ovirup once again for this excellent presentation enjoyed by everybody, and of course I thank uh, Professor Amita Dutto, our AD ma'am again, for. Keeping in such good health and cheer, and uh, retaining her sharpness, this is indeed an honor that will not come again in the lives of most of us. Honoring a teacher when she has turned hundred, this is actually it's a rare, rare, rare event, right? I, 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 I know of only two economists who have touched or crossed hundred. One is Ronald Coase. And the second is uh, Professor Amita Dutto. <laughs> okay, okay. So, Moshumi, uh, you 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 just uh, uh, wind up. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Abhirubda, for your excellent effort in modeling several complicated aspects of farm bills and presenting it using simple tools of microeconomics. Thank you, Shominda, for organizing the session so efficiently. Thanks to all of our seniors, all faculty members, and students present here for making the session so active. And finally, thanks to Amitadi for your patience and active participation in our webinar. So today we will close the session with best wishes to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On you, na kichu bolle na. Unmute, Karo. Unmute, Karo. Anjana, we can't hear you.